A bark named the Olive Bank set sail across the North Sea for what would prove to be a final voyage. Uh, it's one of the most extraordinary escape stories that I've ever heard. Certainly when the ship went down in a minefield in the middle of the North Sea in September. I don't know uh, how many millions to one. Um, there was very little likelihood, but they survived. In the summer of 1996, a diving expedition set out into the North Sea on a mission which was not unlike looking for a needle in a haystack. Smile, you know. <laughs> the leader was Andy Flowers, marine insurance expert and wreck hunter in his spare time. It's not an easy thing to find a shipwreck uh, in, in an open sea. Um, there are thousands of wrecks around the coast of England. Uh, to actually locate one in that area is not easy. The objective was to locate a wreck which had been lost for nearly 60 years. The ship was the Olive Bank and the story of her sinking was so extraordinary that it inspired Andy Flowers to find her. The project was begun by chance with a Christmas card portraying the ship. When I first received the Christmas card in 1985 I decided I had to find her. Uh, perhaps it was an idle thought uh, at the time, uh, but uh, it followed a course around international maritime museums. Uh, I located photographs, I located reports, magazine articles, um, located people in different parts of the world who'd seen the Olive Bank or had some knowledge of her. The detective trail brought Andy to Finland and a rare opportunity to explore a square rigger at first hand. The Pomeran gives Andy an idea of the scale of the vessel he is searching for. Docked as a museum ship in the Ireland Islands in the Baltic, she is one of the few square riggers that escaped the breaker's yard. Uh, the first time I saw uh, a square rigged ship under sail, uh, it was an amazing sight that the feeling of, of power that the ship had without use of engines. It was uh, difficult to describe. Uh, I, I've spoken to crew members who've sailed on square riggers and, and they have been totally inspired by their experiences. We had a crew, a total ship's company of 23 sailing that ship. Just ordinary chaps, fishermen, clerks, university undergraduates, all sorts of people all knowing each other and working together, depending on each other. This was the era of the Great Grain Race. The ships carrying thousands of tons of Australian wheat back to Europe in as little as 70 days. Their crews faced the treacherous storms of the Southern Ocean and many ships were lost. And those that survived speak of the special bond between crew and ship. Once the ship's at sea, your body automatically reacts to the movement of the ship. You're more closely involved, you're closer to the sea, you feel her lift, lunge, and lean to the wind, you know. You become part of her in a way no steamer man could ever become part of his ship. The Olive Bank was built in Glasgow in 1892. Steel hulled and with four masts, she was known as one of the most elegant of the square riggers. In July 1939, the Olive Bank arrived in Barry Docks in South Wales. She discharged her cargo of grain and took on ballast for the final leg of her journey across the North Sea to Finland. War was looming and the ship's owners were keen to have the Olive Bank back before hostilities broke out. Her destination was the Ireland Islands in the Baltic, home port for the Gustav Eriksson fleet. 
the Olive Bank set out on the 29th of August and entered the English Channel. For five days she sailed towards her destination, only to receive disturbing news. War had been declared, and the North Sea was a likely field of conflict. Almost immediately after the declaration of war, a British destroyer hailed us and they told us that Britain had declared war and that we would continue at our own risk. They didn't say anything about minefields, but while our radio receiver was working, we'd heard that a trawler had gone onto a mine and had sunk. Alarmed by the prospect of sailing into a war zone, the ship's captain called a meeting. But the 21 crew had been away from home for months, and their decision was to continue, despite the risk. They set sail across the North Sea and straight into a situation of utmost peril. A minefield had been laid in their path by the German Navy. Beneath the ship, tethered to the sandy seabed, hundreds of deadly mines lay in wait. To navigate uh, in the North Sea in an area where they thought there were mines must have been an extremely uh, difficult thing to do. Uh, they noticed debris from uh, ships and so on that was floating on the surface and they assumed that uh, they'd struck mines. As they went further north, uh, they started noticing mines on the surface. And once they had that, they had lookouts uh, forward and up the masts and uh, with the idea of locating the mines and uh, the feeling that the crew must have had when they first started sighting those mines must have been one of, of horror and, and trepidation to actually think that um, they had found themselves in the middle of a minefield and perhaps no way out. I was off watch. we just finished our meal and they called out that they'd seen a mine. We were in the aft forecastle, and we went up on deck and looked at that first mine. And while we were standing there looking at it, the ship sailed onto the second mine, which was below the water. The mine ripped a hole in the Olive Bank's starboard side, laden with thousands of tons of ballast more than a hundred miles from land. Her fate was sealed. Her crew had just seconds to act. I looked up at the rigging and the sails were flapping like handkerchiefs. They were ripped to pieces by the pressure of the explosion. And then you didn't have time to think. You had to get yourself to the lifeboat. We knew we were far from land. Uh, the main mast fell, um, the ship uh, listed to starboard and then started going down very quickly and within a few minutes was sunk. The olive bank sank so fast that most of her crew were trapped in the vessel as she went down. Fourteen drowned. Only a handful of men managed to struggle clear and although they launched a lifeboat, it too quickly sank. For seven survivors, death seemed inevitable. Um, there was very little likelihood of them being picked up uh, in that area. It was 100 miles off the coast of Denmark, 211 miles off the coast of England, and on the easterly tail of the Dogger Bank. Now, uh, not a very inviting place to find yourself in the water. Divine and, and, and for me. And very it was, for me, a very strange and moving feeling. Imagine, I was just a young boy of 18 to 19 and thought the ship was unsinkable. 
For me, it was terra firma, but it proved not to be. This was the first Finnish flagship to sink in the Second World War, the first square rigger to go down in the Second World War. Um, to experience the loss of a ship like that must have been uh, so traumatic. The survivors found themselves swimming for their lives, but a single stroke of luck was to offer them a slender lifeline. The ship had sunk in 53 meters of water, but the tip of one mast was taller by a few meters. As the ship settled on the bottom, most of her masts broke. As luck would have it, one still stood. And in a twist which might have come from a book of nautical tall stories, a precarious perch remained above the water. For the moment, they were safe from drowning, but only a rescue could ultimately save them. One hundred miles from land, the survivors of the Olive Bank shipwreck were clinging to the mast in a minefield in the opening days of war. The chances of a rescue were incredibly remote. It was something we'd been thinking about, but the chance was very small that help would be on the way. We saw, the first day, a steamer passing, but it was far away, so it did not see us. About the same time, an aircraft flew over, but they did not notice us either. I would say that in the beginning, when we got out onto the yard and were sitting there, that our chances felt like seven out of ten. Then, perhaps they were 50-50. And later, they felt about 4 out of 10, or even lower. As night fell, the morale of the survivors plummeted. Their condition was deteriorating with every passing hour. I can only say what one of the men said. No, we weren't nervous, but there was some tension. He said, well, if we get rescued, I'll believe there is a God. One of the crew members tried to cut his wrists and, and uh, detach himself they were tied onto the, the spar, detach himself from the spar, but his uh, shipmates uh, dissuaded him to, from doing that. As I said earlier, towards the end, even I, even I began to think about going out for a swim. The survivors had now been clinging to the mast for more than 30 hours. As the second night fell, rescue seemed an impossible dream. Next morning, a ray of hope. Miraculously, a Danish fishing boat did appear on the horizon. The survivors tried to attract its attention. We borrowed a singlet, and someone, probably it was Blomqvist, climbed up as far as he could and waved with it, yelling at the top of his voice. Then, as I said before, the fishing boat began to turn away. They thought we were the periscope of a U-boat, a submarine. But then, for some reason, they realized that we weren't, and that we were people sitting on the stump of a yard. The rescue boat, when finding these survivors, must have been uh, amazed that they came across these seafarers in the middle of the North Sea. Uh, when they plucked up the courage, they, they approached the crew and took them out of the water, but apparently they were in such a bad state, uh, with hypothermia and so on, 
that it was some while before they could describe their uh, uh, the situation. Um, they were taken back into Esberg from where they were repatriated to Finland. And there the story of the Olive Bank might have remained nothing more than a memory had it not been for the determination of Andy Flowers to find the wreck itself. His detective trail led back to Finland and to Captain Kulberg. The survivors and rescuer stories gave Andy the final clues as to the possible whereabouts of the Olive Bank. In my summer house, summer house, well, I can live there winter time too. Uh, the first information that I had was based upon a position that was given by the seafarers who picked up the survivors. That position is marked on a British Admiralty chart and it's uh, marked as position approximate. That means that uh, the wreck could be anywhere within approximately five miles of that area. I calculated when I first started that the area of sea that I would have to search was about 85 square miles. and. Coincidentally, uh, the position of the olive bank was very close to three areas, three positions, where fishermen snagged their nets. June 1996. Andy and his ten-man dive team head out into the North Sea on a ten-day expedition. In the target area, they identify a massive wreck, situated in 50 meters of water. Was this the end of the detective trail? We located a wreck on the seabed in the North Sea, having used a position that was given to us by a fisherman. Um, it came up on the echo sounder, a very uh, large echo, and it must have been something quite big down there. I was the first to dive the wreck with uh, a colleague of mine. Um, we both went down the shot line, uh, and as we approached the seabed, uh, we could see the loom of the wreck appearing. The look of the fishing nets was almost shroud-like. They were draped across different parts of the ship. You, you, you had the effect that uh, the ship had been covered uh, to protect her from the elements uh, in some way. The bow was beautifully shaped and it went into the, uh, the bow sprit uh, uh, and the bow sprit uh, extended beyond the bow for about 15 feet. Uh, and as we approached it, that is what I saw and uh, I thought, we found the wreck, and, and it was uh, a surge of adrenaline that was uh, amazing. The divers searched for proof of the wreck's identity, but the ship's name and her bell eluded them. Nevertheless, Andy was sure this was the olive bank. I did experience uh, a little narcosis, and I was swimming around the forecastle of this uh, uh, ship, uh, totally elated. As I came to the surface and saw my shipmates, it, it was uh, something else, you know. Very difficult to describe, but uh, elation and satisfaction after so long researching it. Talk to me loud. What is great? I saw the forecastle, two pairs of bits. It's definitely the olive bank, no doubt about that. <laughs> Andy's team still hoped to prove her identity beyond doubt. But on subsequent dives, unexpected evidence came to light. The presence of hundreds of tons of granite ballast was a worrying mystery. Andy knew that the olive bank had been carrying sand on her final voyage. The granite blocks cast a doubt on the identity of the wreck. I'm not sure. Andy decided to show the diving footage to two of the original survivors in Finland. Perhaps they would remember if there was granite in the hold. This was a tense moment. Would Captain Kulberg agree 
that the wreck was the olive bank. Do you think it's the olive bank? No. No? You don't think there's any chance that this granite blocks was loaded Absolutely with... Absolutely not. No? Not that much. There's hundreds and hundreds of tons. <clears throat> there's a lot of granite, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Captain Kuhlberg's reaction was disastrous news for Andy Flowers. The mystery of the granite block seemed to indicate this was a different wreck entirely. He continued the quest with Alban Bjorkman. She was in Barry after discharging the grain cargo. She loaded some ballast. And you can see the ballast here. Granite blocks. Can you remember what the, uh, the ballast was that you loaded in Barry? Sand. It was sand ballast. Yeah. And was there any bits and pieces of rocks in the sand or not? No. No, no just plain sand. Sand, yeah. And, and do you think there was any other sort of stones and rocks in the sand? They have a, a stone in the bills. Yes. The ballast. Permanent ballast, no. stone in the bilge. No. Ah, that would explain it. No. If, yes, uh, maybe. So she could have had permanent ballast yes. be beneath the flooring. The concern Under. about the granite ballast has Under. probably Under. been explained Under. by Captain Bookman. It's so a very Under. encouraging uh, interview. Yeah. I think that was, that was a really good story. I, I'm happy that... Uh, uh, my confidence has been more than restored. The contents of the cargo hold were not the only clue to the wreck's identity. The dive team also brought up metal artifacts, including the ship's chronometer. A serial number printed on its face may, with further research, provide the final proof that the wreck is indisputably the olive bank. It was the most eerie feeling when we examined the hands on the clock and noticed that the hour hand was stuck between three and four. One imagines the ship sinking and ending up on the bottom, on the seabed, and the chronometer flooding with seawater and the hand slowing and stopping at the time that uh, these men were there. Until he can prove that the chronometer is from the olive bank, a question mark will always hang over the identity of the wreck. One thing is certain, for those that survived, her memory will never fade. Yes, you have to admit it, it was a great escape. Things like that don't happen very often. The only thing that changed was my way of thinking. I began to think more about life and its meaning. That was the difference. Men. No, be true. But it increased my belief in God. I believe in God now more than before. And Great Escapes continue tomorrow at 7.30. Next, it's Top of the Docks and a triple bill as the raging planet plays with wind, waves and fire.